so please good evening everybody so i welcome you all for today's uh, session on clapsy prevention so this is actually one of our uh, part of our resist collaboration for people who are new uh, who have newly joined and other nurses and fellows who are not aware of this uh, resist collaboration we are actually a collaboration of six nicus of bangalore that is uh, indira gandhi institute of child health chinmaya mission hospital st john's hospital ramaya medical college and two centers of ovam hospital so you must be wondering what are we doing we are trying to address the problem of antibiotic antibiogram that is blood culture positive what is the most common organism what are the sensitive antibiotics can we frame a common antibiotic policy for the region so we were trying to address this question so so far uh, we have so far 209 isolates and we want to attain a sample size of 224 so we have enrolled nearly around 90% cases over last 21 months we were fortunate to have presented our study in the virtual pediatric academic society meetings last year and we need to thank sir for all the help for all the motivation for all the support so far so so far we were trying to address the issue of antibiogram now we are trying to move towards infection prevention so first step in infection prevention is probably clapsy prevention we are fortunate to have with us an expert today dr lakshmi shrinivasan madam so i think people uh, who do not know her so she actually is currently the faculty at children's hospital of philadelphia she attended her medical school at madras medical college she did training from children's hospital of michigan so she also has neonatal perinatal medicine fellowship from children's hospital of philadelphia her primary areas of interest is improving sepsis recognition and response discovery of biomarker signature for sepsis she is also the chief physician leader hospital wide for prevention of clapsy she also heads the chop nicu sepsis quality improvement work group she has numerous index publication if i am not wrong more than 70 pubmed indexed publications so we welcome you ma'am Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abhishek. I'm really delighted and honored to be here today to um, talk to your uh, Resist collaboration about um, my experience. Um, and my sincere uh, thanks to Dr. Gautam Suresh for giving me this um, opportunity to share um, some of our, our knowledge and our experiences with your group. Um, uh, first, before I start, um, want to check that you can con you continue to hear me well, Dr. Abhishek. Oh, we can hear you, ma'am. Great, and I'm just going to share my screen so I can pull up some um, slides, and then um, I'm hoping that you know part of this talk is the didactic portion where I go through my slides. But after that, I'm really looking forward to some vibrant discussion as well, where we can sort of really think about you know what what things can, from what I've said may apply to your context and where you might have to think differently, and how I can you know even help you troubleshoot some of your uh, local. Uh, issues. So, really looking forward to this session. Um, let's see. Great. We are able to see your screen, ma'am. Perfect. Okay. Um, just gonna <clears throat> maximize this. Yep. So thank you so much for that very nice um, introduction, uh, Dr. Abhishek. And uh, as you said, I work at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And uh, for context about our NICU, because I think that's helpful to know as I talk about some of our local experiences, uh, we are a level four referral uh, NICU, uh, do everything including ECMO, we're 102 beds. Um, and we are a mix of inborn, outborn, preterm, plus very complex term kids who come in for surgical and various you know, subspecialty um, uh, evaluations. And I have been leading the Clabsy prevention efforts at the hospital for the last, uh, say, four years or so. And it's been really insightful because not only have, have I learned a lot about our NICU context, I've been able to compare it with the other ICUs. We have a PICU and a cardiac ICU. So really learning what... 
uh, specific factors are important for NICU environments has been really helpful. Um, and as I've led the QI work, it's also spurred some, you know, research opportunities for me, which I'm happy to share later or pass the talk if anyone's interested. But we're doing a project looking at our um, MRSA genotypes, we're doing whole genome sequencing and uh, some geospatial mapping to understand where the MRSA is coming from. Uh, we have a microbiome project related to CLABSI that's going on, and we're doing a lot of predictive analytics, looking at our, uh, our data sets and looking at uh, risk factors locally to sort of understand what predicates risk. So all of that to say is that, you know, QI work can really impact patient care, but QI work can also spur innovation and um, research. Um, so just wanted to say that um, at the outset, there's so many opportunities that come out of, you know, doing this kind of work. Um, so the objectives for my talk, I thought I'd divide it into three parts. You know, the first is the why, you know, why does CLABSI prevention matter? Um, the second part is the what, you know, what can we do to prevent uh, CLABSI? And, you know, these parts are actually in some ways easier, right? We look at um, the evidence that's out there and the literature and, um, you know, it, it tells us what's going on. The third part is the the hardest, which is the how, you know, how do you take all this information and then how do you actually uh, implement it um, in a way that gets you closer to uh, zero, zero harm or zero collapses. Um, so diving right in, um, the part one, you know, why does CLABSI prevention matter? And to talk about that, I'll start off with some, you know, definitions, you know, how do you go about just defining, because to understand the problem, you really have to have a clear definition. And in our um, institution and in generally in US institutions, we really go by the CDC uh, criteria for bloodstream infections and CLABSIs. So for a bloodstream infection, it's basically any recognized pathogen from one or more blood cultures. And that's irrespective of source, be it a central line or a peripheral, uh, you know, peripheral culture, um, you know, that is a bloodstream infection. Or if it's a common skin contaminant, such as, you know, coagulation negative calf, then you need both, um, you need more stringent criteria, which is the common skin contaminant needs to be cultured from two or more blood cultures, drawn on separate occasions, and you need signs of um, clinical sepsis. So those are the grounding definitions that we use for bloodstream infections. And then when, when these bloodstream infections happen in the presence of a central line, and it's a primary infection where we don't find another attributable secondary source, like you don't find a UTI or a pneumonia or a necrotizing enterocolitis as another source of infection, then we classify this as a primary um, CLABSI. Um, and for, so like I said, our goal, our reference standard is really the definition set up by the National Healthcare Safety Network or the NHSN, which is a branch of the CDC. And we are very rigorous in how we um, uh, define this. We actually have independent adjudicators. We have infection prevention um, team members who review the positive blood cultures hospital-wide. They apply the NHSN definitions and they strictly adhere to these. There is also NHSN says they can randomly audit institutions. So we, we're really very strict about it because we want to make sure that we are staying true to the letter of these definitions. Now, are these definitions perfect? Um, not always. I mean, sometimes a clinician may feel strongly that something uh, does not feel like it's coming from the central line. There's a different source. But based on how the surveillance criteria are set up, the, sur the surveillance definition may still meet uh, CLABSI. But what we all agree to is that reporting to a common objective standard is important. So if every institution reports to the same standard, then everybody may have the same flaws or the same limitations to the definitions. But if each institution starts tailoring or tweaking the um, definitions based on what they're seeing locally, then we're not reporting to the same standard. So uh, you know, when that disagreement happens between clinical and surveillance definitions, we just agree to disagree and we say we understand for surveillance purposes, you will report this because it meets that framework. But clinically, we will make a notation that this may, may feels like it might be from a secondary source. And I think this is important because again, as you collect data, you want a systematic standard way in which definitions are made so that um, everyone is uh, actually measuring the same thing. So talking about, you know, principles of transmission, um, 
As you all know, medical devices provide uh, portals of entry, and this is especially important in our vulnerable you know, neonatal population. And so organisms are able to migrate um, from skin and mucous membranes into sterile body sites. And these uh, devices can disrupt our host defenses, and so they also provide us a, 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 a nidus where bacteria can uh, flourish. Um, the conventional teaching has been that, you know, um, implanted or more permanent um, types of devices like tunnel catheters, implanted ports have sort of less risk than non-tunnel catheters like PICs or um, umbilical venous catheters. I mean, for the NICU population, typically it's, you know, the PICs and the UVCs that we're thinking about. Uh, but really all vascular catheters are associated with an increased risk of infection. If you think about mechanisms of um, how infections happen, we classically think of four major mechanisms. There is extra mm -hmm. um, where you know you have um, contamination that's happening typically, you know, at the time of insertion and bacteria around the catheter and they you know make their way uh, through the track um, into the body. Uh, more classically, in the neonatal population especially, we think about intraluminal contamination. And here we really focus on the catheter hub and how all the ways in which we could um, contaminate it, um, you know, through our hands or through other, you know, contaminants. Um, other mechanisms that we talk about are hematogenous, you know, coming from some other distant sources we've talked about. And then a contaminated infusate, for example, if you have TPN or other fluids that may contain um, uh, bacterial content that could lead to um, infection as well. So as you, again, as you think about your infections locally, it's important to think about what mechanisms may be at play because your strategies to tackle them would be focused on um, wh whichever mechanism you think has predominance. Um, also, another way to distinguish extraluminal versus intraluminal contamination is thinking about relationship from time of insertion. Extraluminal contamination typically happens quite related to insertion within the first few days of insertion. But as time goes on, and if an infection happens much later uh, in the course of a catheter's uh, presence, then you typically think it's an intraluminal contamination situation, something contaminated the hub and, you know, bacteria got in. So knowing your data locally on when do infections happen can also help you make that distinction of uh, what, what the causative mechanism is. Um, and then, you know, when we talk about CLABSIs, we can't not talk about, you know, biofilms. So within 24 hours of placement of a catheter, biofilms uh, begin to develop. Uh, there's, um, you know, fibronectin and fibrinogen that get deposited. You develop a fibrin sheath. And then bacteria love this, you know, this matrix that's now in the, in the catheter and they adhere to it. And the bacteria further sec secrete some saccharides that, you know, further increase their um, uh, development of microcolonies um, and um, lead to this big growth of um, biofilm. This is an especially important mechanism for certain types of bacteria, especially like the coagulase negative staphylococci and, and other, you know, staphylococcal species. So what do we know generally about from the, from the, uh, you know, literature about what all are risk factors for CLABSI? We know that patients who are in the hospital for long periods of time with a long duration of catheter presence are higher risk. If there's heavy microbial colonization, at the catheter exit site that um, uh, increases your risk. Um, location in adults, you know, there is in, in femoral and internal jugular have been implicated. Those kinds of data are not clear in the neonatal population. Um, of course, anything that increases your immunosuppression or immunocompromise, prematurity, neutropenia um, can matter. Um, but there are other factors too in terms of what you infuse. There's been associations shown with total parenteral nutrition, transfusion of blood products. Uh, but also the care of the catheter we provide is a big risk factor. And then staffing ratios in the US has been multiple studies that show when you have tighter nurse to patient ratios that's in, associated with increased um, hospital acquired infection. So it's clearly a complex problem and you really need to think through the layers um, uh, to think through what all you need to address um, as you go along. Um, and a word on, you know, why does CLABSI prevention matter? Um, you know, 
we I think we moved from a paradigm of um, where we used to say, you know, device associated infections are inevitable. You know, it's we're, we're providing the sophisticated complex care. Our patients are sicker. So infections are part of the price that we, you know, pay for that. And, uh, you know, people also used to operate under the framework of, you know, clabsies are benign and, you know, we can just treat them with antibiotics and our patients um, will be okay. But we do know that clabsies are not benign. Multiple adult and pediatric studies have shown an increased um, odds of death. And then in the neonatal population, there's obviously so much data about the associations with mortality and adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes from having infections as well. Added to that are the issues that you are very well aware of, of you know, increased antimicrobial resistance. And the fact that you know, when you have an infection, you're also going to subject the patient to more lab testing, increased length of stay, increased interventions, and increased cost as well. So clearly there is a strong case for why we need to do our best to prevent clabsies. And the myth that, you know, you can't do, you know, clabsies are inevitable is also, I mean, it is really a myth, you know, because clabsies are largely preventable. If you look at the data from U.S. National Acute Care Hospitals, you know, they saw 50% decrease in clabsy between 2008 to 2014, uh, decrease in MRSA bacteremia, and really all of the success is attributed to bundles of interventions. I find this graph that depicts the pediatric hospitals data, pediatric and neonatal hospital data um, over you know, the period from 2007 to 2012, so powerful. That blue line, it represents the CLABSI rate and you can see just how over the years as bundles of interventions were implemented, they were able to decrease the CLABSI rate dramatically and you know, just shattered that myth that you know, we have to live with the CLABSI rate that we have. This is our data from my hospital as well. And as you can see, very similarly, we kind of mirrored what that previous graph showed over the years. Our CLABSI rate too, as we've adopted, you know, intervention after intervention and worked on our bundles, you can see how we have demonstrated this um, uh, beautiful decline in our CLABSI rate as well. And are we at zero? No, we, we still have uh, lots of work to do but we have been able to attack some low-hanging fruit and really um, get rid of some of the easier to prevent um, CLABSIs. So that, I hope I convinced you that this problem is important and there's a reason for why um, we need to do this. The second part is where I really want to talk a little bit about the evidence and then dive into the, the QI approaches as part three. So the part two is a little bit about the evidence, you know, what all is out there that we can use to, you know, prevent um, CLABSI. And this is broad strokes. I, I will say it's not comprehensive, but I just pulled out some of the uh, data elements that might be interesting to uh, review. Um, so, you know, when you think about general principles and CLABSI prevention, you want to start with thinking about, do you really need this device? Then you want to provide, you know, education and training to everyone involved in the care so that they all perform to a certain standard. Um, and for that, you really need to set up your bundle practices. You know, hand hygiene is the cornerstone. You hear, you hear me say that multiple times through this uh, talk. And really, you want to maintain clean and aseptic techniques for care of the catheter around insertion and maintenance. And you really want to think every day about, do I need this line? Do I need the risk it brings? Or uh, am I ready to get rid of it? And that's really important to be intentional and ask that you know, question every day. And as you go through this, you also want to be really collecting um, data and thinking about um, uh, what uh, are the risk factors that you're seeing locally. So in terms of hand hygiene, I don't need to tell you about this. Obviously, the most common mode of transmission of pathogens is via hands, and that's been proved uh, since time in memoriam uh, from the time of Semmelweis. And we know that hand hygiene um, reduces the incidence of infections. And hand washing or alcohol-based hand rubs are equally good options as long as the hands are not visibly soiled. And there's lots of data that alcohol-based hand rubs have really improved workflow and ergonomics and make it easier to you know, uh, do the right thing. Uh, so that's certainly an important option to um, include in your um, plans. And you know, this is the WHO um, schematic around the five moments for hand hygiene. So again, really important as to embed this, these five you know, moments into uh, everyone's brain around like, these are the moments you really need to be thinking about hand hygiene before touching a patient, before a procedure, after touching a patient, 
um, or the patient surroundings and after body fluid exposure and really thinking about, you know, where all are the breaks um, in our care related to this. Um, CHG bathing is another thing that's really picked up over the last decade or so. And these data originally came from adult ICU patients um, and uh, given the great benefit in bloodstream infections that were seen, um, we now have this included in our basic practices for CLABSI prevention in many national guidelines. Uh, in the pediatric population, there was a multicenter pediatric trial which showed a 36% reduction in bacteremia. Um, so, but where are we with neonates around CHG bathing? The data is still a bit murky and confusing. Um, the FDA recommended use with care in premature infants or infants under two months of age. And there's always that worry about the risk of, you know, skin irritation or chemical burns. Um, this is a recent um, um, NICU meta-analysis, you know, CHG cleansing in the NICU. And um, the analysis is limited by number of studies and sort of heterogeneity in how they applied a CHG. And the findings were mixed in that, you know, CHG cleansing didn't show a significant effect on neonatal sepsis overall. But when you look at the lower forest plot, which is um, bacterial colonization, uh, it did appear that uh, CHG cleansing was associated with reduced bacterial colonization. Also, there were only two studies which looked at CLABSI specifically as an outcome, and both of them showed a significant protective effect, but since there were only two studies, they didn't you know, put them up as a, as a forest plot. Um, but in balance, it does seem like you know, if you have a high CLABSI rate, CHG cleansing probably has benefit. Uh, the question around what gestational age to uh, start at, how frequently to give it, are still questions that you know need to be fully um, elucidated. And even in the U.S., you'll find a lot of variation. Different hospitals set different um, cutoffs for them. We say we you know we'll use it past 37 weeks, but I've heard hospitals wait till two months you know post term, and some hospitals start even more uh, even earlier with their preterm infants with CHG. So there's a lot of variation in where we start using CHG, but a lot of Nick have started um, including CHG cleansing as part of their bundles of care. Um, here is another a NICU specific uh, source of data which came from the Slug Bug Collaborative. This was a multi center improvement collaborative across 18 children's hospital NICUs, um, uh, part of the Children's Hospital Neonatal Consortium, of which um, my hospital is a part. And so they really did an orchestrated testing approach. Uh, they compared um, various um, strategies uh, to see which were most um, effective. It was a factorial design type study. And they looked at you know, which um, elements of the bundle were most effective at decreasing CLABSI. And what they found was that when you use hub scrub compliance monitoring, the, the centers that focused on that, along with a sterile tubing procedure change, those decrease CLABSI rates um, more dramatically than other centers. So this again provided uh, direct evidence for including these elements um, in our CLABSI bundles. And um, most recently, I uh, just came across this very recent, in fact, it's just getting published uh, this month, uh, it's coming out next month, but it's available online. A uh, very nice systematic review looking at uh, the whole list of interventions to pro uh, prevent neonatal healthcare associated infections um, in uh, you know low and middle income countries and really many of the studies that looked at bundled interventions found an impact and they list the various sort of bundle components that were listed in these various studies um, so obviously education hand hygiene you know developing surveillance processes um, staff feedback, CHG, thinking about blood culture quality, developing infection control checklists, and thinking about environmental cleaning approaches. In addition, they also listed some other studies of isolated interventions around feeding and supplements, topical emollients, um, kangaroo mother care, you know, massage therapy. Uh, but this was um, a nice, I think, relevant and, you know, a comprehensive list of uh, interventions that could be um, considered um, as you develop your local bundles. So that's some of the evidence around, you know, what all you could consider as candidates to include in your CLABSI prevention bundle. 
But now we come to the, you know, the real uh, meat of the talk, which is how do you actually take all of this and how do you put it into your local uh, practices and get uh, closer to zero in your collapse rates? And, you know, when you think about quality improvement, you, you want to think about these steps and not necessarily in this order, you could do some of these things simultaneously, but these are the important uh, uh, items to consider and I'm going to talk about them step by step, you know, defining your bundle, building your team, tracking your data, and you may already be doing some of these really well, but, you know, some thoughts on how to um, enhance that. And then really building out that standardization of care with repeated uh, PDSA cycles. Um, and then finally, you know, building that culture of safety and what you're already doing, which is, you know, participating in a collaborative. And these steps you may have to reappraise periodically and go back and you know improve each of these steps. It's not a one and done. You you may have to go back um, in a in a cyclical manner. So what is a bundle? Um, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement defines this as a group of um, evidence based you know best practices that individually improve care, but actually when you apply it together. Um, you will result in, you find substantially greater improvement. But the key is being consistent, being highly reliable in application, and that will lead to the improved outcomes. So the key is not just taking those practices, but how do you implement them in a way that you achieve um, consistency. So when you think about how to build your local Clabsy bundle, um, you know, where all this is sort of a modified evidence pyramid that, you know, think about when you think about how to get data for your QI approaches. So obviously, if they're neonatal studies from your type of environment, those would be an ideal place to start when looking for uh, components of your bundle. But sometimes you don't have neonatal data for everything. So then you're sometimes left looking at adult and pediatric data to think about, you know, do, do we think these practices that work in a different environment might still be valuable for our local environment? So you may use that indirect evidence and try it out. Um, and then if, if there's no evidence at all on a topic, sometimes what you're left with is benchmarking with other institutions, other collaboratives, uh, what, uh, you know, or seeing what they're doing and you know, trying it out locally. But the key is as you develop your bundle to really make it context specific. You, know, you need to think of the bundle that works for you and not um, add in elements that you think are really not relevant to your local environment. So take all of this information and think about what are the key elements that you know, belong to what you will be able to implement locally. So here are some examples of you know, insertion bundles. Um, this is what we do um, locally and very standard you know, common sense items. And again, with bundles, you wanna be focused and simple. You don't wanna make it very, very complicated. So again, insertion bundles, you, know, you wanna think, is this line necessary? And then think through the steps of the procedure, hand hygiene, hand hygiene, um, sterile precautions, uh, and then skin preparation sterile dressing and then you know an insertion checklist is something that's highly recommended to just make sure that you're going through all of this in a sequence of um, um, events so here again is sort of an, a standard insertion uh, checklist uh, which just makes sure that you don't miss any of these uh, questions or the sequence of uh, events and just um, um, makes your practice very standard for um, insertion um, and then in terms of a maintenance bundle, again, focus on very, so again, this is an example, it doesn't have to be the bundle you, you pick, but here are some you know, key elements that uh, we use at our institution, which is daily discussion of the line. Again, hand hygiene prior to any catheter handling um, and any access of the, of the, uh, the hub, uh, you, know, you have to scrub the hub uh, before you access it. And then we really have set up processes for uh, sterile techniques for dressing, tubing, and cap changes. And then maintaining a secure dressing. And then we really think about patient and environmental hygiene as well as part of our bundle. <coughs> so again, thinking about you know, these broad aspects and then how, what, you know, what the specifics are for your institution. 
So this is an example of what we call our easy reference tool. It goes in each of these. So every nurse, every physician at our hospital has access to this easy reference tool, which you know on the left side gives you the bundle and broad strokes, but then the additional details really help people think through. So what does that mean when I have to think about you know, dressing integrity or standard access or standard line changes, what are the components that um, go into this? So again, building something like this for you locally for yourself locally will really help to you know disseminate um, the practice so then you know you've developed your bundles think about who should be on your team for clabsy prevention and what i've learned over the years is it really takes a village to make this work this is um you know you really have to spread out and you may start as a small team but as you go along you're going probably going to accumulate more members of the team who can enrich um, ideas. So for us, you know, we have nurses, physicians, um, we have the infection prevention team, we have vascular access experts, um, we have QI and data support, uh, we have fact of, you know, staff of who are really experts at thinking about the human factors that go into workflow. Um, and we, you know, for us, families are a big part of what we do. So we have family partners advise us on, you know, how do you message certain things to families? Uh, so that's the, it's a really important part of our um, teams. We've even included members of our environmental services and cleaning staff, because as we think about the environmental hygiene, we want them to hear how that impacts, you know, patient um, infection risk. And that, that really leaves an impact on them and they take it back to their work and, um, uh, impact care. So really think about and you, when you start your team, it may not be all these people. But as you go along, you may find that you, you really want to think about who has expertise in this area and how do I pull them into the work. The third point I want to make around QI is that, you know, data drives improvement. And it already sounds like, you know, your collaborative is doing a really nice work in terms of collecting objective data. From a QI lens, I would say you want to collect your outcome metrics, you know, around CLABSIs, you need to know the number of central line days that you are experiencing in your unit to understand your rate. And uh, you should be, you know, beginning to track it longitudinally in statistical control charts. Um, also, as you go along, as you make any interventions, you want to annotate when you did that so that you can see an impact on your outcome as you um, um, add interventions. You also want to measure your process metrics. You know, you've set up your bundle. You want to think about how are you going to track these bundle elements? How are you going to audit them? And I'll talk about that in a minute. And then when patients have CLABSIs, you, you do want to collect data from your review of the CLABSIs as well. What are, the, what are the pathogen details which you're already collecting? Uh, but also thinking about what are patient factors, you know, um, what was the gestational age or the postnatal age, what other, you know, comorbidities did the patient have, um, any catheter factors, are there certain types of catheter, age of the catheter, do, you know, at, is there a specific point at which your infections are happening? And then if you're able to collect some data around the care of the catheter, that may be important as well. Now, while data drives important, I will caution that you do not want to get into analysis paralysis where you're waiting forever for data to accumulate before making QI improvement um, uh, changes. You, you want to go ahead and get started with, you know, low hanging important interventions, you know, hand hygiene doesn't have to wait for data, you know, these are practices that you can start to implement um, even as you get your data up and uh, running. And then um, another um, issue you might see sometimes is, you know, inter-rater reliability. So here, for example, is an, a graph that we track locally, which is all the elements of our bundle and, you know, we track process compliance. And, you know, at a certain point, we noticed we were always suspiciously high, but it wasn't being reflected in our outcomes. And, you know, we changed up our observers, our auditors um, uh, into more experienced nurses. And we actually found initially a dip in our uh, process compliance. And we realized that, you know, we just didn't have good um, reliability in our auditors. So again, thinking about how you're going to train your um, auditors, um, you know, will ensure reliability of your uh, data. Um, here's, uh, you know, another example of how data can be helpful. So for our NICU, we now have about eight years worth of data and we really use that data um, to look at, you know, what factors are associated with uh, CLABSI in our um, NICU. And as you can see, dwell time uh, was a significant risk factor, certain line types for our NICU, in fact, Broviac lines are higher risk. 
um, we found that ephemeral location was uh, trending towards higher risk as well. So again, having collecting data systematically over time can really give you the opportunity to do a deep dive into your local data and understand you know, what might be a predisposing infants in your NICU to risk of infection. Um, thinking about the QI approaches, and now I'm going to go into a bit of examples around, you know, the kind of QI approaches we use. So, you know, this is um, the Kaizen philosophy, which is continuous improvement in cycles. And you're all probably very familiar with the idea of the plan, do, study, act. You know, you find your problem, you really systematically analyze it, you think of solutions for it, you know, you implement them. Uh, then you analyze your results um, and then you see, you know, did it work? Did it not? Uh, if it worked, fine, then you adopt it. If, if you think it needs tweaking, you adapt it. Or if it's not working at all, you abandon that intervention and you move on to your next one. And you just, you know, repeat this. So this is really the philosophy that underpins um, the improvement work that we do. Um, sorry, this. And this, um, you know, I'm not going to go into the details of the slide. It's very busy, I know. But this, uh, again, as we start off on a QI project, it's important to be systematic about it and think about um, a key driver diagram. You know, what's, so what's my goal, you know, to achieve um, a certain rate of um, infections? And, uh, you know, what are the primary drivers? What all do we need to focus on? So for us, we decided it was about line insertion, line maintenance, and line removal. And then based on that, we then thought about, you know, what are the things that then drive those aspects of the work? And then on the rightmost column, you see how we enumerated, you know, possible tests of change. And this is very comprehensive. It's a lot of tests of change. So you may ask, you know, how do you go about implementing so many, you know, tests of change? Uh, but we really look at this as a living document. We review it every quarter. We sort of see, you know, which of these things have we achieved. And then every year we sit down and we update it and we revise it totally if need be. If next year we say, you know, this is not how we want to be approaching it. You want to change our paradigm. We may, you know, change our key driver diagram to fit what we think uh, we need for the year. And then you take all these interventions that you think about and Again, this is a sample sort of impact effort matrix. We, we again do this every year where we think about, you know, or even more than once a year if we need, thinking about what all interventions did we think about, but um, <coughs> which are likely to have the highest impact. And then how much effort do they need? Because if it's um, low impact, but high effort, then, you know, it's not worth uh, doing. On the other hand, if it's high impact, but low effort, you know, those are the things we really need to take on first because they could have a high impact. They're not hard to do. So again, undertaking this kind of exercise locally, thinking about, you know, what all interventions might you want to um, um, try out and then mapping them out and picking just a few. So for us, we came up with these 14, but at the end of it, we said, you know, we're just going to focus on like three things to try to get through initially, and then we'll, you know, move on to the, to the next. So again, these are examples uh, of just how to systematically approach um, the work. Um, education is, of course, always a cornerstone of anything we do. But in quality improvement, there's a saying that, you know, education is necessary, but not sufficient. It's not enough to make all the change. But it is really important, you know, so both you need to think about how do you educate new staff, and then for existing staff, how do you have refreshers, you know, periodic re-education? Uh, it is important to think of the idea of developing some, you know, educational champions who can spread uh, the education. And there are different ways in which you can think about it. Could it be interactive things like skill stations or carts that you roll around and teach um, staff? Um, uh, could you develop some teaching videos uh, that, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So, you know, teaching videos could really help um, teach staff as well. And then I'll talk about K cards, uh, which we have found to be a very powerful tool uh, locally. So for those of you who are not familiar, K cards stand for Kamishibai cards. And they come from the Japanese idea of storytelling, visual storytelling. And what we do is um, they were originally used in, I think, um, um, manufacturing to think about, you know, how well are processes being, do, uh, being done. And uh, what our auditors do is they instead of just filling out a checklist, they actually directly observe staff, talk with staff and say, you know, are you doing these elements of the clapsy bundle? Show me how you scrub a hub or show me how you do these procedures. And as they watch, they, they're both auditing, but they're also, it's a great opportunity for teaching and coaching. 
and um, at the end of it you know for a particular um, audit uh, the auditor will decide whether it's green you know the staff knew every element of the bundle or if it's red if they missed even one element then it's red and then if you put it up in your unit you know you can get a sense of so on the lower right hand uh, side of the screen you can see how it looks um, you know in that first shift there was at least one person who had a red but in the second shift everybody was green and it's not meant to be individually punitive or anything but it gives you an idea of the state of the unit you know how well does every one know the things they should be doing or do we have some scope for um, improvement so this has been a powerful tool for us both for auditing collecting our process data but also it's a great tool for coaching as long as you do it in a very um, you know puni um, non punitive you know friendly approachable uh, manner and it's you know it's been well received by our staff um, and then when a CLABZ event happens, again, you, you really want to set up a process for this where you do an apparent cause analysis. You think about, you know, what are the contributing factors and what can we do to prevent this from happening again? Ideally, you should have a multidisciplinary group of people who are involved in the care of the patient reflecting on the event and saying, you know, what could we have done better? Where did we maybe break our bundle practices? And again, same thing, you know, to get people to share, you really need a very non-punitive environment. You need to say upfront, you know, the focus here is on learning what we can change, what we can improve in the system. It's not about blaming. Uh, for the apparent cause analysis for CLABSIS, there are online, you know, toolkits available or I'm, you know, I'm happy to share how we set up our templates. We have a red cap into which we enter uh, data on this. Um, and you know, communication is such an important part of this work and it's really bi-directional. You want to be disseminating learnings uh, you, from these apparent cause analyses or, you know, new interventions that you're undertaking. You really want to spread it to the staff. But at the same time, you also want staff to report concerns if they are feeling that, you know, there's something that's a barrier to providing optimal care. Maybe certain products aren't working, the process or the workflow. Uh, you know, you need to be able to have that bi-directional communication to really understand what might might be a barrier to um, success. Some of the things we do locally, we um, have multidisciplinary walk rounds. Um, I walk around uh, with nursing staff once or twice a week to talk uh, to people and just find out what's going on. Uh, you know, we try to elicit um, input from staff meetings or we sometimes set up like a clabsy coffee hour just to talk about, you know, informally talk about practice. And then uh, folks can email if they're shy about talking about things. And we also have like an online reporting system where people can report problems anonymously. Again, if they, they you know, they're shy about, you know, having that direct uh, conversation. So all of this, you know, this is so important to foster that communication because then you'll know quickly if there's a problem rather than finding out after it's become a really big issue. Some more examples of intervention, specific examples, you know, these may be helpful as you think about um, local interventions. We have direct observers for hand hygiene. It's so important. So many of our interventions are around um, hand hygiene. Um, and we give, you know, real time feedback to staff anytime there's a break. Um, I don't know if any of you use glow gem, which kind of glows in the dark and, you know, again, making people put it on their hands and try to wash it off and then show them where all, you know, glow gem is left, you know, sometimes in the crevices between your fingers shows, shows them how important it is to do proper um, hand washing. But again, for hand hygiene, you know, workflow is so important. So we've thought a lot about the human factors approach, which is, you know, how do you make the right thing easy to do? Everyone has good intentions, but if you don't have an easily accessible sink or alcohol-based hand sanitizer close by, um, you know, these things can have an impact. Uh, <clears throat> one example for us, when, when during the, um, uh, the worst of the COVID pandemic, uh, there was a shortage of our regular um, alcohol hand rub and we had to switch to a different bo bottle. Now, a regular one, you could do like a one-handed pump action and staff could get alcohol on their hands and clean. The new bottles had a weird smell and, you know, they, there were fewer of them less in the unit and they had to be tipped over um, to get it out. And staff started reporting, actually, some staff, again, this speaks to the communication piece. Some nurses came up and said, we feel like, you know, these new hand sanitizers are just not as effective because 
Um, you know, they don't smell good. I, we, we're seeing staff not use them as frequently. And, you know, even small things like that can make a difference to compliance. And so we listened to them and we said, let's try to solve this problem. And we tried to find some alternatives that were more likely to be used. And um, again, making it easier for staff to do the, the right thing. A, a key piece of around hand hygiene is we also talk to families, we educate families to speak up as well. And we say, you know, if you see someone coming to touch your baby without washing their hands or using the alcohol hand rub, you should speak up. And that's that's really important because every, we're all in this together and it's also important modeling for families of behavior. Here's another example of how we disseminate uh, some of our bundle elements. Uh, we talk to our medical teams, our physicians about, you know, what they should be talking about with the line every day. You know, is the line still needed? You know, is this the right line for the patient? Are there any problems with the line? Can we do something to decrease the number of times we're breaking into the line? And then also ask every day or at least every few days, like when can, when is this line ready to be uh, removed? And, you know, we have examples of what are those elements that you need to be thinking about as you ask each of these um, questions. We've also had interventions around the scrub, scrubbing of the hub um, with, you know, alcohol or CHG. And we emphasize, you know, 15 second scrub. Again, glow germ, you can see this, this is a hub. The picture on the bottom is a hub and it shows glow germ on the leftmost panel. It shows glow germ where there's been no scrubbing of the hub. And then it shows as you do a five second, 10 second and 15 second scrub, you know, how the glow germ goes away. And so that, you know, this visual is so powerful. Many staff, you know, have commented on how seeing it, you know, told them how important it was to do the 15 second, you know, scrubbing. <clears throat> but even then we un uncovered a, another human factors issues. Sometimes the staff said, I have no idea how long I'm scrubbing because there's no easy access to a clock. And, you know, in the NICU, we're not allowed to wear watches. So then we had to do a simple thing, which was just make sure, you know, every pod had visible clocks with second hands. So staff could actually do the right thing. So again, thinking of those workflow aspects can be really important to solve your problem. Um, for the environment of care, here is an example of what we do. We do this ATP testing of surfaces, which tell you kind of how much bacterial content there is. And you know, the top graph shows our ventilator surfaces, the bottom graph shows our IV pumps. And, um, you know, it really tells us, um, you know, which surfaces may be less well cleaned. And, you know, that helps, again, us focus our interventions on, you know, these, these surfaces need to be cleaned uh, better. And it really gives our <clears throat> tests of change for that, um, for envi envir <clears throat> environmental cleaning. Um, so those are some examples of QI interventions, certainly not comprehensive, but uh, just a sampling to give you an idea and how you can tackle these bundle elements with common sense approaches. You know, find your local problem and think of different ways to solve it. Try it out, try it for a while, track your data. If it works, you continue. If it doesn't, you know, you drop it and move on to the next um, idea. Um, but equally important to developing interventions, testing them out, is building that culture of safety and this is really hard you know but but it is so important as a highly to become a highly reliable organization where you have you know low infections low harm to patients you you need to have certain common um, a certain common culture one is to say you know this work is hard but we should continue to work towards a goal of zero. We should be determined to achieve safety for our patients, you know, even though it is hard and it's going to take repeated trial and error. Also, you really need this just culture where everybody can speak up, everybody can report errors without fear of being punished. Um, and, you know, we say, if you see something, say something. That way you find a problem early because if people are scared, then problems get hidden and you find them really late. So you really need to encourage that culture. The third aspect is collaboration across ranks, across disciplines. Um, you know, we really want this feeling of shared accountability. CLABS is not just a nursing problem. You know, we all have a role to play in it. Um, and then going around, you know, your unit doing partnered rounds or having leaders round can send a powerful message. 
Lastly, you really need as an organization to be willing to commit resources because clearly all of this work is going to take time and where does that time come from? So you need your safety teams, you, you know, teams uh, where people are willing to spend time and resources doing this uh, work and you need to build up that, you know, group of champions who can do this work. Um, so again, this is just an example of how we've tried to change our physician mindset at um, my institution where there used to be this feeling of, you know, physicians say, oh, a lot of this is nursing related work, so we don't have a lot to do. But, you know, we really tried to say to physicians, you need to know about CLABS, you need to act with your nursing colleagues, and you really need to influence unit culture because, you know, physician behavior can greatly impact everyone's uh, belief that, you know, these infections are uh, preventable. Um, and finally, you know, what you're already doing, but I ca cannot say enough about how powerful collaboratives are, you know, I have firsthand experience, um, CHOP, like many U.S. pediatric institutions participate in more than one collaborative. We have something called Solutions for Patient Safety, which is a safety collaborative. And um, I love their guiding philosophy. They, they say, you know, as in this collaborative, we don't compete on safety. We should be willing to share. There's nothing that we want to hide or compete with each other on because we, we should all have a common goal, which is to keep our patients safe. And the other philosophy for this collaborative is all teach, all learn. No matter how big or small you are as an institution, you probably have something to teach another institution and you probably have something to learn uh, from another institution. So these are great principles. Uh, we also participate in the Children's Hospital Neonatal Consortium, which again is a great place for us to benchmark and standardize and learn from um, others' practices. And I think from the collaborative, there's so many things you can do. One is you can set up some general guidelines for bundles. Each hospital can obviously customize within that, but the collaborative can set a uh, you know, broad um, set of um, guidelines together. And then <coughs> collaboratives provide this rich um, uh, source for benchmarking, discussion boards, webinars, you know, where you can share both your problems and your successes and, you know, learn from each other. Um, there's plenty of evidence that collaboratives have led to decline in, in CLABSI rates. And then, you know, when you're part of this kind of group, it can really spur on innovation, research and advocacy, even to, you know, uh, improve care all around. So I hope I've convinced you that, you know, this is this is not a, a quick fix, but there is a journey and there is a process with which we can improve our reliability and prevent um, infections. Um, and you know, it starts with building your bundles and you know, really thinking about what are those practices you want to implement. Uh, but the you know the reliability culture, building that culture is a really important piece of it. And then making the right thing easy to do, uh, thinking about your workflow, all of that matters to really move towards um, preventing infections. And this this work has to span all disciplines, all levels, from leaders down to the bedside. Everybody needs to believe that you know infections are preventable, and everybody needs to commit to getting towards uh, zero, and that's that's the way to make something like this um, work. So I hope this has been helpful to you, and um, I hope I'm leaving you the message that you know CLABSIs can be prevented, and it's really, uh, there's a few important steps to build in, you know, build your bundle, think about the basics, um, you know, standardize, measure, educate, and think about building these multidisciplinary teams and how do you nurture a culture of safety and then really use your collaborative to its best advantage to advance care across all of your um, institutions. Um, this is actually a picture that I'm very, um, you know, that's really dear to me. It was actually from our visit to, we did, we did a bunch of benchmarking. This is pre-pandemic, that's why you don't see any masks. But we went around and then we spoke to a bunch of other institutions. You can say that, you can see the thank you sign. We visited Boston Children's, Texas, um, Children's National, and then we learned so much from them and we shared what we knew as well with them. And that, again, is the power of the collaborative to really um, advance uh, care across all institutions institutions. So I'll stop there and uh, look forward to questions and feedback. Uh, let me just say thanks to Lakshmi for giving us an excellent talk. Uh, that was a really treasure a trove of information, Lakshmi, and I'm glad we invited you.
So I'll hand over to Abhishek and uh, let's have a discussion. Thank you. Sorry, I was late. I was stuck in another meeting. Thank you so much, Gautam. Thank you, Gautam, sir. And uh, thank you, Lakshmi Madam, for that comprehensive talk on CLAPSI. I think you motivated all of us for that collaborative as well as for the quality improvement efforts. So I think it was a comprehensive talk. And before I actually open up, uh, we are quite uh, inspired by that K cards, which we do not use. And second thing was about chlorhexidine bathing. So we had a lot of uh, concerns about safety. I think Shrikant is part of our collaboration. He could do uh, partly a RCT on chlorhexidine cleansing versus spirit. They, he had some concerns about higher levels of chlorhexidine in uh, preterms. So I think I could see that in CHOP you are using chlorhexidine bathing. Could you, uh, have you found any uh, skin irritation or any problems there or you have any cutoff like below some gestation, you don't use them? Yeah, thank you for that question. At CHOP, we decided, again, like I said, the, the data on the gestational age, lower gestational ages of prematurity is lacking. So at CHOP, we only use chlorhexidine once they hit 37 weeks gestational age. Um, and so for babies younger than that, we just do soap and water bathing. Um, and even that, you know, we uh, do not do daily for lower gestational ages. We do like every other day. The philosophy being, again, you want to decrease bio burden on the, on the infant's skin. And so less than 37 weeks, we, we're not sure of the risk of CHG for the things you said, like the studies that have shown that there is some CHG content in the bloodstream and, you know, unknown um, effect on the developing preterm infant. Uh, so we do, yeah, soap and water for younger ages, and then we we start a CHG past um, 37 weeks. But there's a lot of practice variation. I'm curious if Dr. Gautam has um, anything from his practice at his institutions. Yeah, at Texas Children's, uh, we used to do it at 35 weeks and above when the skin was more mature. Uh, but again, uh, one point I want to make is that everything that Lakshmi described is for the U.S. context. And in India, you have to decide based on the evidence and the setting and the actual risk factors locally, which ones you want to adopt versus not. For example, my feeling is in India, a lot of the infections are due to peripheral IVs, not central lines. So that requires a different strategy. So I think Lakshmi's talk is an example of, a good example of the framework and the approach but the exact medical interventions and the strategies, you experts in India will have to customize and select. And I have to apologize, I have to rush to another meeting, but I'll catch up with you guys later. Sounds good, thank you. Yeah, and I think that's where your data collection might be very helpful to because if you are systematically collecting, you know, whether patients had a peripheral IV as well as a central line at the of infection, you can really get to know um, what, you know, what your risk factors are. So I think that's going to be, as Dr. Gautam saying, like that is going to be key to think about, you know, where do you need to focus your efforts? So for CHG, I mean, you may well, if you want to do it, I mean, the question is, do you want to do a randomized trial or do you want to do like QI, um, a quality improvement cycles, you know, try it out for a while and use, you know, your historical data to compare. You could do, you know, either approach um, depending on uh, if you have the ability to do, but you have six centers. Also, if you want to do some sort of a center-based, uh, you know, um, a randomized trial, that that is also, you know, something to think about. I think there's only, I mean, I was looking at the CHG data uh, for the neonatal population. I don't think there's been too, too many, like I was showing you the meta-analysis, there's not been a, a, a ton of studies and each one had slightly different design. You know, some of them use CHG once a week, some of them um, used it more frequently. So it's, it's kind of, even with that meta-analysis, it's kind of hard to put all of that data together. Yeah, Dr. Lash Lakshmi. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm Dr. Bikramjit. I'm uh, heading a neonatal ICU in eastern part of India. 
so i use a uh, chg twice a week in all across gestation even in preterms and i found it relatively safe considering the it- irritation part also so um uh, my i just had two questions uh, for you one is that i have seen that in my group once these babies with central lines they are receiving steroids as a part of their second week to take them out of ventilation then i am seeing the risk of sepsis is actually going up versus if they are not receiving steroids so can you suggest or do you face similar problems and do you have some strategies for that part that would be my first question and the second question is that in a sick baby where we have a central line and there is a clapsy and there is a difficulty in establishing a second central line in that case what do you suggest we should do should we continue with that central line or whatever thank you yeah no these are great questions um the steroid question interestingly you know we also found an association with steroids in our local data but it's a very different population we have a big older baby chronic we are a chronic lung disease center so we get babies sent over at older ages repeat courses of steroids to try to get them off the um, a uh, ventilator and some of those patients who are you know on longer um, or repeat courses end up with um, infections but i think what you stated about your local data that's precisely the kind of thing you want to be um, evaluating right you know you're seeing that there is this association between steroid use in the second week and um, risk of clabsy i think then the question becomes um, the risk benefit if if that clabsy is leading if the steroid is done with the goal of getting the infant off the ventilator but really you're ending up with clabsies and um the baby stays on the ventilator anyway then the question is do you try to um work on your feeding advance first and try to get um the central line out and then uh work on your steroid course or you know again look at your data closely is it truly the steroids or is it something related to um the other kids with the steroids um you know the sicker kids right and do they have a central line in for longer those may also be you know things to think about um uh, and what is your line type is your umbilical venous catheter staying in for longer than 2 weeks we know that then you know your risk of infection sort of exponentially goes up at least us data um so you know is it truly the steroids or is the is it the mark of a sicker kid and other variables that are going into it uh, that you need to be thinking about again not <clears throat> knowing enough about your <clears throat> line practices and whether you do you switch from a uvc to a, a pick line at that time point i'd be curious to know you know are there other factors that go into it but we haven't de- defined any specific strategies for a kid on steroids and you know ways to prevent infections we don't really have anything specific there okay, we usually uh, keep the uvcs around 7 days and try to shift to pic okay and so instead it's this uh, elbw the second week elbw which we usually have a problem with and the second question if we have a sick baby with a clapsy with a central line in which a peripheral line establishment is difficult mm-hmm. yeah uh, sorry could you repeat that question one more time in sick baby oh, if we, if in a sick baby we have a central line with clapsy mm-hmm. and it is difficult to establish a peripheral line for few days to take out the central line and get in the antibiotics and get a sterile culture and then get on so in that case what would you consider yeah i mean i think w- our general philosophy is at every point we say what is the right line for my patient for every line option think of the risk benefit and it becomes a risk benefit analysis if you feel like the safest way to get your patient from point a to point b is a central line then you put it in and you um, deal with it and you think of ways to keep them safe through that process if it's an extremely difficult access and you think you're going to the patient is going to be in jeopardy with just peripheral access i think um you know th- there's nothing we we always say that you know if we need if we need a central line we'll put it in and then we just do everything we can to try to keep the uh, patient safe i would say even for those you know patients that you'd mentioned the elbw is getting the steroids again if they're getting higher infections but they need steroids you i think the 
strategy then is to think about what else can you do to enhance you know infection prevention for the you've identified your high risk group of kids can you develop some enhanced vigilance around processes uh, for those kids so if you're incurring risk with steroids or with a central line you and you have to do those things what else can you do to sort of enhance your surveillance for those kids so we do that so, you know we use our high risk criteria to actually pay extra attention to our high risk kids we spend a lot of time you know monitoring their care talking to their nurses uh, making sure that everyone has that shared mental model that this is your highest risk today you know this on this unit today these are our highest risk patients for infection so let's be very vigilant about the you know care we provide for them i don't know if that's a helpful answer it's you know yeah constant. yeah thanks a lot yeah we really have this emphasis in our unit on attention to high risk patients and high risk clients and so i think that's been helpful because we have more conversations around those patients and you can see that those nurses are aware because before i think you know we would know the high risk in our minds but if we didn't communicate that with the nurses they were not aware and when we talk about it a lot then you know that those nurses are feeling that um uh that it's so important to uh, you know protect these babies and so i think that is really again the communication piece that's so so important in any any other questions while i wait i want to know what do you i would love to hear from one or two of you what do you think are your biggest challenges to clabsy prevention one of the challenges what we have seen over last 4 years is reposition of lines is one of the major challenges we face with uvcs because the formulas what exist they're not sensitive enough we have lot of nearly around 50% of our lines are repositioned especially uvcs if you are placing in a small for gestation age or for a large for gestation age because these formulas are wrong in them that is one of the challenges what we are facing with clapsy so reposition that is a challenge maintenance fortunately our compliance with scrub the hub is above 90% so with insertion is one of the challenges what we have found in our data Oh, uh, interesting. So your infections seem to be more insertion related, right, ma'am? Right, with repositions. Repositions. So yeah, that gives you a nice target for intervention, then, right? Like if you've identified that that is your problem, then that is your low hanging fruit. You know, pick that to really think about how do you make the standard so everybody does their reposition the exact same, you know, sterile. way that could be a very nice intervention that could have impact right because if the if your infections are associated with that that's an interesting observation in any other comments praveen sir you want to summarize and close it yeah thanks thanks avishek um, um this is praveen here uh, thanks dr shinwasan for an excellent lecture i mean the problems that you said uh, um, especially you were asking about what we are facing in majority of the places it depends on the um, nurse patient ratio so um, on one side in the private sector um, generally the number of patients are lesser but uh, adequate nursing staff are there so you do see lesser uh, uh, problem with the clapsy but it's still there significantly there um whereas in the public sector which constitutes the majority of the newborn care being given uh, in india um the obviously the ratio is uh, uh, you know very skewed um and their uh, sepsis generally itself is very high um so ultimately it is the environment with uh, uh, um, near the baby and especially the people who really matter um they don't have time to think about all these things though from the top or from the leadership we might want to do it um and I totally agree with you that implementation is the challenge and in that most of the implementation strategies that we devise will not include the person who is in front of the baby uh and hence uh, you know we kind of a most of a struggle 
uh, uh, to get the best uh, care. Um, barring, of course, some people are doing a fantastic uh, job, but most of us are still uh, struggling with that idea. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I can just say thank you so much for an excellent lecture. And like, you know, we would continue to look at, uh, you know, how we can implement what we know already. Um, um, you know, all those bundles and, you know, uh, checklists and stuff like that. And that that's the key takeaway for all of us that let's go back to our units and try to see what do we have in our hand and how do we implement that. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words. I hope it was not too irrelevant and, you know, hopefully there were some common threads that, you know, were helpful for your local. Uh, you know, oh, it's context. absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it is very, very relevant. I mean, um, if you visit, you know, do visit our units, I'm sure you would appreciate uh, that. Like, you know, it's absolutely relevant. You know, all I'm trying to uh, imply was that, um, you know, as you would appreciate, uh, we know, but the implementation requires that time and effort from our teams, that, that's all. But, you know, it was definitely relevant. Yeah, thank you so much. I, yeah, I really appreciate this opportunity and I hope I get to learn more of what you're doing too. It sounds really interesting. Uh, looking forward to wishing much success to your collaborator. And yeah, looking forward to seeing more presentations from your group as you build out your work as well. And if you uh, want me to share any sort of local templates for anything or ideas, always I'm always open for, you know, uh, sharing, brainstorming, please reach out anytime. Sure, sure, madam. Thank you. Thank you. So if there are no questions, I would like to thank Lakshmi on behalf of our collaboration. It was nice hearing to her. I think uh, we are next moving towards Gautam sir's talk, possibly next month on uh, prevention of infection. So I think uh, Lakshmi, I'll keep you updated about our collaboration and our QI efforts. So thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. It was a real pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you.